الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله All praises are due to Allah the creator, the cherisher and the sustainer of this universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his noble prophet Muhammad and his descendants and his followers and his companions, dear respected brothers and sisters Jazakum Allah Khairan for coming seeking knowledge uh, seeking the best knowledge which is the knowledge of the best word which is the word of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said khayrukum man ta'allam al-Quran wa'allama the best of you is the one who learns the Quran and teaches it for others so this is a message that I took from my, my, my sheikhs and my scholars and I'm giving it to you you should go and spread uh, the word inshallah and uh, Promote attending such lectures. Promote among your family members, among your uh, brothers and your uh, friends that they should also come to the mosque and learn in the mosque. Uh, today we will start. I wish if, uh, if you can have a, a, a mushaf, a Quran with you. Today we will start from the uh, verse in the ladina yarmuna al muhsanati al ghafilati al mu'minati lu'inu fi dunya wal akhira wa lahum adabun azim this is number one because the numbers doesn't appear in my uh, laptop in the ladina yarmuna al muhsanati al ghafilati al mu'minati lu'inu fi dunya wal akhira wa lahum adabun azim those who accuse honorable oblivious believing women are rejected by God in this life and the next a painful punishment awaits them which one 23 verse number 23 those who have Mus'haf um, or they have Quran on their uh, uh, mobiles open it let's reflect on this verse you know, this verse comes after the verses talking about the slander of Lady Aisha when those hypocrites slandered Lady Aisha. And unfortunately, some of the Sahaba also fell in the trap of the uh, hypocrites and also repeated what they heard. And we learned in the past uh, few weeks what happened and how Allah uh, reprimanded them. But what's amazing here is that the last verse that ends this issue is actually not mentioning anything about the mother of the believers. It talks generally. Those who accuse honorable, oblivious, believing women are rejected by God in this life and in the, near, in the hereafter. A painful punishment awaits them. So Allah here is making it clear for all people that this is not exclusive for the mothers of the believers not exclusive for the wives of the prophet sallallahu every woman should be safe from false accusations should be safe from any breaching of her dignity or her honor same applies on men and we said this before that the same hukm applies also on people if they uh if they uh, slander men but Allah here speaks about women especially because maybe they are more vulnerable and maybe many people uh, like to slander women speak about women about the honor of women and this woman does this does that comes late and stuff like that but they don't speak about men so here Allah is protecting the women from such uh, tradition and of course making it uh, general for all people the what stopped me here is that the verse in Arabic says المحصنات, it means those who uh, accuse muhsanat. the word muhsan in the Arabic language idiomatically means someone married married but literally means someone protected by his or her chastity so here, the 
uh, علماء of أصول الفقه the علماء of the principles of fiqh took the literal meaning not the idiomatic meaning why? because here it will like um, protect more people it will be more general so it means that anyone who accuses chaste women it doesn't mean here married women any chaste woman okay uh, will be uh, this verse will be applied on him those who accuse honorable oblivious believing women what's oblivious the verse says those who accuse or attack the honor of honorable oblivious women women who don't know what is said about them in their back like what happened to Lady Aisha for a whole month she didn't learn what happened what was happening and the rumors that were spreading so what if someone slanders a woman in her face in her presence is this okay still it's the same it is the same sin and the same punishment for that so why did Allah say oblivious here it is it's called in Arabic litanfir, which means to disgust you to make the listener disgusted of this disgusting sin of attacking people in their honor but even if she's not oblivious of what's happening still the same thing it's exactly like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ إِنْ أَرَدْنَا تَحَصُّنَا Do not force your girls to work in prostitution if they want to live uh, a chaste life. What if they don't want to live a chaste life? What if they are not forced into prostitution but they are willing to work in prostitution? Same thing, it's not allowed. But Allah said, do not force your girls to work in prostitution if, if, if they want to live a chaste life to disgust the listener from this awful sin. But still, if the women themselves want to work in prostitution, it's not allowed. Also, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, about, speaks to men only about the, the women that they cannot marry. So he says, for example, you are forbidden to take as wives your mothers, your daughters, your sisters, paternal and maternal aunts, and the daughters of your brothers and daughters of your sisters, and your milk mothers and milk sisters, listen to this, and your wife's mothers and your stepdaughters in your care. وَرَبَائِبُكُمُ اللَّاتِي أَلَّاتِي فِي حُجُورِكُمْ مِن نِسَائِكُمُ اللَّاتِي دَخَلْتُمْ هِنْ يعني It says, you cannot marry the daughter of your own wife who was raised in your house like your daughter what if she was not raised in my house what if she's I, I never saw her before can I marry her still not but again here it is to disgust the listener from this disgusting action how come you marry the daughter of your wife that's it so it says the daughters of your wives who were raised in your houses in your care so that's again I was just giving you other examples from the Quran on this issue which is that sometimes the Quran says something but um, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, if the women are not oblivious then this uh, uh, verse does not apply on them verse number 24 Allah here says speaking about those who slander people on the day when their when their own tongues hands and feet will testify against them about what they have done subhanallah some people used to say until 10 years ago how come are you telling me that the tongues will speak and the hands will speak and now subhanallah one of the main accepted evidence in any court is dna <laughs> which means that the body itself is testifying today in this life what about the hereafter anyway here Allah says that their tongues their hands and their feet will testify against them the issue is reflect with me why does God need witnesses God knows everything 
Why is God bringing witnesses on the day of judgment? God sees everything, hears everything. He knows every single thing that happens. God is bringing those witnesses because God is just. And it is not justice that anyone is punished without knowing why he is punished and what are the evidence. Compare this to in some countries, for example, in the USA, there is something called the secret evidence. Someone can be sent to jail for life, a life sentence, without even knowing. He knows why, he knows what is the charge, but he doesn't know what's the evidence. He doesn't have to know. This is a, a new law that was made during the uh, uh, presidency of George Bush. Allah is bringing witnesses on the day of judgment on you. And you know that you sinned, and he knows that he sinned, but you have to know the witnesses. And the issue is, why these organs will witness against a slanderer? The tongue and the hand and the feet. In another verse, Allah spoke about the kuffar. وَيَوْمَ يُحْشَرُ أَعْدَاءُ اللَّهِ إِلَى النَّارِ فَهُمْ يُوزَعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا مَا جَاءُوهَا شَهِدَ عَلَيْهِمْ سَمْعُهُمْ وَأَبْصَارُهُمْ وَجُلُودُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Allah says that the non-believers on the day when God's enemies are gathered up for the fire and driven onward, their eyes, their, their ears, their eyes and their skin will, when they reach it, testify against them. So why this time Allah did not mention the same uh, witnesses that he mentioned before? the eyes and the ears and the skin. This time it is the tongues and the hands and the feet. The tongues that spoke, that spread the rumors, that threw the accusations, and the hands that pointed. When the woman was passing, he pointed. And the feet that walked to spread the rumor, because after she passed and he told the rumor, he went to another table and told them, the tongues, the hands, and the feet. Those are the three things that are involved in spreading a rumor. But not the ear, maybe. Not the ear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ إِذِي يُوَفِّيهِمُ اللَّهُ دِينَهُمُ الْحَقِّ وَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقُّ الْمُبِينَ On that day, God will pay them their just due in full, and they will realize that God is the truth that makes everything clear. So Allah will take revenge for all people, for all women. You know, there are women who are protected because they are from uh, strong families, uh, high uh, from high lineage so people don't dare to talk about them they are protected by their families they have uh, strong brothers or they are from a rich family or but there are others who are like vulnerable women single moms who live alone and people can easily talk about them Allah here is actually saying that all of them are the same for Allah and he himself will take revenge for these women. He himself will punish anyone who dares to speak about these women. Verse number 26. This verse says al khabithatu lil khabithin al khabithat the word khabith means corrupt khabithat is the plural of a, a female corrupt here it either means scholars of tafsir here differed they said some of them said it means corrupt words kalima is a, is is a feminine uh, word in, in, in Arabic. So, al khabithatu can mean corrupt words are for corrupt people. And corrupt people are for corrupt words. And al tayyibat can mean good words come out from good people. 
and good people are for good words. And they also said that no, it can mean corrupt women, because it's a feminine word. So it can mean uh, corrupt women are for corrupt men, and corrupt men are for corrupt women. Good women are for good men, and good men are for good women. The good are in, uh, uh, the good are innocent of what has been said against them. They will have forgiveness and a generous provision. I actually, definitely, I personally, I like more the tafsir that it means words, because the whole context speaks about. Actually, the context speaks about women and about rumors and words too. So both are acceptable, of course. But for me, I see that the context more talks about words and the things that are said. And to reflect upon this, there is an Arabic proverb that says, "Kullu ina'in yamdhu bima fi," which means every container pours what's in it. So from a jar of honey, you will get honey. But from a container of poison, you will have poison. And this is a message to every one of us. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Good words come out from the mouth of good people. And dirty words come out from the mouth of dirty people. كُلُّ إِنَاءٍ يَنْضَحُ بِمَا فِيهِ you have a jug of honey, you get honey. You have a toilet, you'll get. Yeah, that's the issue. The problem is today, we get corrupted by the society. The same tongue that says, Dhikrullah, la ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, astaghfirullah, cannot say F words, cannot say dirty words. We have to be watchful. Watch your tongues. Clean your mouth. Because when you clean your mouth, you're cleaning your heart too. Or at least, the opposite, at least a clean mouth is a sign of a clean heart. So be careful of what you say. And if we consider that it means women, then we should be also not do the same mistake of the guy that I told you about because the verse in the beginning of the surah that says, la yankihu illa zaniyatan aw mushrika. The adulterer doesn't marry except an adulteress or a, an unbeliever. So that guy who got married to a woman and at the day of their, of their wedding, he beat her up. And we went, are you crazy? Why did you do that? He said, because she's an adulteress. How did you know? He said, because I committed adultery a few years ago. And the verse says, adulterers only marry adulteresses. I said, are you crazy? The verse says this, which means don't marry people who are involved in prostitution and stuff like that. And we know that, and I, I explained to you what it means. And that uh, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was a companion whom in the Jahiliyyah, before Islam, he had a relationship with a prostitute. So after Islam, he met her and she said, why don't you come and spend the night uh, in my house? So he went to the Prophet and said, oh Prophet of Allah, can I marry her? And then the verse came, no, believers cannot marry prostitutes. So that's what it means. But it doesn't mean that everyone who committed zina will marry someone who committed zina. This is not true. The same thing here. It doesn't mean that because the verse says, al-khabithatu lil-khabithina wa al-khabithuna lil-khabithat, that good, that corrupt women are for corrupt men, it doesn't mean that a corrupt woman cannot marry a good man. It can happen definitely. And that a good man or a, a bad man, a corrupt man cannot marry a, a good woman. She, he, he can de happen definitely. But it means choose well. If you're a man, if you're a woman, choose a good person because you deserve a good person if you're good. That's what it means, which means don't just get married without choosing well. Take your time and make sure that the person that you marry are, is a good person. With the verse number 26, now this is the last verse that talks about uh, slandering honorable women. So, subhanAllah, from verse number 4 till verse number 26, 
is dealing about these issues. Slandering honorable women, and he talked about the slander of Lady Aisha at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu All this reprimanding the society and disciplining the society that it's not proper for a Muslim society to have rumors spreading in it. It's not proper. All this purifies the society and protects the individuals in the society from slander, from bullying, from rumors, from gossiping. It's improper. If you are someone who prays in the mosque, fasts uh, Mondays and Thursdays, but you slander people, but you backbite people, then there is something wrong with your ibadah. Verse number 27. We are now starting a new theme. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tadukhulu buyutan ghayra buyutikum hatta tasta'nisu wa tusallimu ala ahliha thalikum khayrun lakum la'allakum tadakkaroon Believers, Allah is talking to believers. Do not enter other people's houses until you have informed them and asked their permission. That is better for you. Perhaps you will, be, you will bear this in mind. Again, believers, God is talking to you. Believers, do not enter other people's houses until you have informed them and asked their permission. That is better for you. Perhaps you will bear this in mind. Let's reflect on this. This means that every house has a sanctity. Every house has a kind of sacredness. And there is an etiquette to enter it. You cannot just enter people's houses like that. You cannot enter places like that. There is etiquette. Etiquettes of visits. But before we speak about that, we need to speak a little bit about a concept of awra. The word awra. Some people think that it means private parts, private organs in the body. Not necessarily. Aura is anything that you hate people to see. Aura is anything that if people see can bring shame to you. For example, if you have broken furniture, a broken sofa, and you don't want people to see it, it is considered aura. So you may not allow someone to come into your house because you have a broken sofa. It, so it, you consider it aura. You don't like that. Um, an elder who lives with you at home and sometimes he's like wearing his, uh, his underwear in the house like that. So this is for you, consider the aura that you don't want anyone to come from outside and see him. So the aura is anything that brings like, it, it makes you feel shameful. And of course, the other meaning which is a, a, the, the famous meaning that it is the private parts. So these verses, from the, the coming three verses, will be regulating visits between uh, foreigners. When I say foreigners, I mean non-relatives. You're not the foreigner of your sister. Your sister is not foreign, a foreign woman from you. Uh, your aunt is not, and so on. But I mean between non-relatives. Actually, it means, not relative for, for in, the, in the Sharia, means anyone that you may one day get married to. So your uh, sister-in-law, the wife of your brother, is a foreigner. Because you can marry her one day if your brother dies, or if your brother divorces her. So she is still a foreigner. Okay. But your mother-in-law is not. You may never be able to marry her again, you, you, or to marry her, I'm sorry. Your aunt is, a, is not a foreigner, is a relative. Okay, what about visiting mahrams or uh, relatives? This is coming at the end of the surah, not now. Now we will talk about foreigners, how foreigners visit each other. And subhanAllah, usually the Quran just gives guidelines. But when it came to such etiquette, etiquette of visiting each other houses, 
it went into the details. Why? Because actually culture differs from one country to the other. So because of this culture difference, this can create a lot of problems and a lot of friction between people. So here, the Quran had to unite all Muslims on one culture. Of we, we should have only one tradition of how to visit each other. Because this is something that can create friction. And then when I just enter your house like that, you tell me, how come you enter like that in Bangladesh? We don't do that. But in Egypt, we do that. This will create problems. So here, the Quran went into details. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ أَمَنُوا لَا تَدُخُلُوا بُيُوتًا غَيْرَ بُيُوتِكُمْ حَتَّى تَسْتَأْنِسُوا Or you who believe, do not enter other people's houses until you have تَسْتَأْنِس تَسْتَأْنِس means inform them. Inform them there is someone outside by any way. Say, Allahu Akbar, or Bismillah, or <clears throat> clear your throat. Yeah, that's by the way what the scholar said. And nahnaha. I tried to find nahnaha in the English language. I couldn't find it. So it's like clearing throat, right? So to clear your throat. <clears throat> Let people know that there is someone outside the door. Okay? And when they say, who is it? Today, it's the ring. You ring the door. Or you knock the door. Okay? This is isti'nes. Tasta'nisu. And then, وَتُسَلِّمُوا And say, Assalamu alaikum. But actually, in this verse, to salimu means take permission to enter. By saying, Assalamu alaikum, can I enter? Can I come in? But you have to say, Assalamu alaikum. So, to salimu here doesn't mean only say, Assalamu alaikum. It means, Assalamu alaikum, can I enter? The difference between Taking permission uh, in Jahiliyyah, before Islam, and after Islam, is that before Islam, people used to say, good morning, and they just enter the house like that. They just, doors at that time were not, didn't have locks. Just open the, the, the door and enter. Maybe they find the man with his wife in bed. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What's sorry? Why did you enter like that? So that was the time in Jahiliyyah. That's what they used to do. Good morning, and they enter. In Islam, you have to inform people that someone is outside, and then you have to take permission by saying, Assalamu alaikum, can I enter? There are some uh, nice uh, stories or examples from the seerah. A man stood at the door of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and shouted, Can I enter? He didn't say, Assalamu alaikum. Just suddenly, the people inside the house of the Prophet heard someone shouting, Can I enter? So the Prophet told a girl called Rauda, go out for him, for he doesn't know how to take permission. And tell him to say, Salamu alaikum, can I come in? So she went outside and she told him. See, the Prophet cared a lot about teaching people and had no problem that a little girl would go out and teach a man. At that time, the Prophet وسلم, was able to destroy all these wrong traditions of the Arabs. Kilda ibn al-Hanbal narrated, a companion of the Prophet, that he was carrying some food and milk for the Prophet, so he entered his tent in one of the battles. It was a battle, and, and, he, and before the battle, there, was, there were tents. He just opened the tent and entered, because he was carrying things with him, food and milk. So maybe the Prophet could have given him some excuse for that. So the Prophet told him, go back out. Then say, Assalamu alaikum, can I enter? So he went back out, carrying the things again. Assalamu alaikum, can I enter? The Prophet said, now you can enter. Um, yes. Not only the Prophet, it is one of our rituals, an important ritual called Al Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi an al Munkar. Advising each other, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Nicely. Ummu Iyas said, we were four women who went to visit Lady Aisha. After the death of the Prophet, Lady Aisha lived uh, for some years and she was the teacher of the Ummah. So four women went to uh, visit her. And Ummu Iyas was one of them. And she said, one of us stood at the door and she said, can we enter? 
So Lady Aisha from inside said, no, tell your friend to ask permission well. So we said, Salamu alaikum, can we enter? So she said, yes, now you can enter. They know what to do, but they forgot. Sometimes we know the right thing, but we're like, hey, come on. Not necessarily, don't be hanbali, stuff like that. What's wrong with being hanbali? Do I have to be Hanafi because I'm in Eastern the mosque? Anyway, so she said, no, don't enter. Ask permission well, so they know what to do, and they did it. Note here, Lady Aisha is the student of Prophet Muhammad so she was the teacher of the Ummah. Why do people take permission? In order not to see something inside that is aura, that the person would li won't like people to see it. As I said, not necessarily. Someone maybe not wearing her hijab, not necessarily, maybe just broken furniture. This can be aura for him. He doesn't want you to see it. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the one who believes in me as a prophet should not enter a house until he informs people that he is outside and ask permission. But if he looks inside the house, so he is considered as, I, as, as he already entered. What does it mean? When you say, Salaam Alaikum, can I enter? You already entered. You entered with your eyes. Don't look inside. So the Prophet said, if he looks inside, he already entered. Which means, lower your gaze. You can. We will speak now about how we knock the door, how we enter. But we will speak about this. But now I just wanted to know that permission is given so that people cannot see what's inside. So what's the point of taking permission while looking inside? You cannot do that. That's why there's a hukm here, that if someone spies on other people, from the uh, keyhole and they poke his eye from the keyhole, they are not by the law, they did not commit any crime and they are not to be punished and they are not to be compensated for his eye because his eye is considered hadar, worthless because he's a spy. You cannot spy on people. These things are very strict in Islam. People should be protected in their privacy. Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet said that permission is three times. The first one is for them to hear and realize that someone is at the door. The second one is for them to get ready. And the third one is for them to allow in or send back. So the Prophet said that you need to take permission three times. Salaam alaikum, can I enter? No one responds to you. Wait a second and then say, Salaam alaikum, can I enter? No one answers you. The third time. Salaamu alaikum, can I enter? No one answers you? Go back. Don't say Salaamu alaikum, can I enter for the fourth time? The Prophet said it is three times. Ring the bell three times. Knock. Three times. But don't stay for half an hour knocking on people's door. Maybe they are not ready to allow you. Maybe they are shy to tell you, go back. Some people don't have this uh, guts to go out and say, excuse me, I can't receive you now. Can you please go back? They can't do that. So they just yeah, they pretend as if no one is at home. Don't stick to the door. Hmm. What if after three times asking permission, still no permission is given? Can the one by the door enter? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari narrated that the Prophet said, if one of you asks permission thrice and was not allowed in, then let him go back. That was at the time of the Khilafah of Umar. Abu Musa narrated this. So Umar said, bring evidence on what you said or I will punish you. If you don't prove that the Prophet said so, you will be punished. Ubay ibn Ka'b stood up and said, I witnessed that the Prophet said so. Umar told, of course, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is a great scholar. But Umar told him, I trust you, but I wanted to warn people from lying against the Prophet. I don't want people to forge a hadith. So I meant to do that. Umar was so strict. What about knocking the door hard 
or shouting very loudly at people uh, inside. This is also forbidden because it hurts people and it scares people and it scares children and it scares people who are uh, maybe sleeping inside. It annoys people. And the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Hujurat, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجُرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ but most of those who shout to you, Prophet, from outside your private rooms, lack understanding. Ignorant people. Ignorant. Only an ignorant person would knock the door hard like that. Or would shout loudly like that. How to knock the door and ask permission? Abdullah ibn Busri said, a companion of the Prophet, كان النبي إذا أتى باب قوم لم يستقبل الباب من تلقاء وجهه Amazing. Abdullah ibn Busra said that when the Prophet ﷺ used to visit people, he doesn't give his face to the door. He doesn't stand up facing the door. He gives his left side or his right side. And he says, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, can I enter? Why don't give your face to the door? The door is closed. Maybe the man or someone or a kid opens the door while his mom is still running behind him to wear her hijab and it's not wearing her hijab. So you saw her. So you should knock the door, say salam alaikum, and you give your side so that when the door opens, you don't see what's inside. That's a beautiful religion. Allah, we should th thank Allah for being Muslims. That's a beautiful religion. Abba Sa'id استأذن على رسول الله مستقبل. Okay, there was someone called Abu, Abu Sa'id. He took permission from the Prophet and he was facing the door. So the Prophet opened, he found him facing the door. He told him, don't you ever take permission again facing the door. Teaching the Ummah. What about sending someone from the house outside to bring you inside? So, for example, not necessarily that the owner of the house allows you in. If he sends a messenger, someone who works for him, a helper, a kid, he, who goes and opens and tells you, come with me, you go with him. You don't have to say, Assalamu alaikum again. You don't have to do that. If a messenger is sent to bring the visitor, he should just enter with him. Abu Huraira narrated, everything that we say should have an evidence. Don't allow anyone to play with your mind. I like always the questions to be at the end, except this question, without any permission. What's your evidence? This is the beauty of this religion. And the first, when I, when I started to learn this, the first thing I learned, when I started to learn religion, the first thing I learned is that no scholar is greater than being asked, what's your evidence? So when I sat, used to sit with Sheikh Qaradawi, and he used to teach me something, I tell him, what's your evidence? This is our religion. We have to protect it from anyone forging anything or injecting anything into it. Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you was invited and came with a messenger, then this is a permission for him to enter. You don't need to take permission again if there's a messenger who is entering with you. Also, scholars said that if there are people who are allowed to come in always and frequently, like your own assistant, okay, who like works in, in your office, this applies even in, your, in, your, in, in offices, by the way. But if your own assistant that enters, he doesn't need to take permission every time he enters. You are ready and you know that he's entering. So those who are frequently entering places do not really have to take permission. What about people who are relatives? For example, a man, does he need to take permission before entering his sister's room and Ata ibn Yasar. Ata ibn Yasar said that a man asked the Prophet Sallallahu do I need to take permission before entering my own sister, sister's room? The Prophet said, yes. Or do you like to see her naked? Ata qala ibn Abbas. This is the student of Ibn Abbas. Do I have to take permission before I enter my own sister's rooms. 
They are orphans who live with me in one house. Ibn Abbas said yes. Ibn Abbas, this is one of the four Abduls, al abadil al-Arba'a, one of the most knowledgeable people about, uh, among the Sahaba. And he's teaching, he said, yes, you have to take permission. He said, so I argued with him to give me a permit. It's hard to do that. So he said, no, do you want to see them naked? Exactly what the Prophet said before. He said, no, I don't want to see them naked, but please. And he said, I started to argue with him again. So he said, do you want to be obedient to Allah? He said, of course. He said, then take permission. Of course, even your own sister. You have to take permission before you enter her room. Verse number 28. What if no one is in the house? No one is in the room. فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُوا فِيهَا أَحَدًا فَلَا تَدُخُلُوهَا حَتَّى يُؤْذَنَ لَكُمْ وَإِن قِيلَ لَكُمْ ارْجِعُوا فَارْجِعُوا هُوَ أَزْكَى لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ عَلِيمٌ if you find no one in, do not enter unless you have been given permission to do so. If you are told, go away, then go away. That is purer for you. God knows well what you do. You remember last time's homework? It was this verse. I told you. God here says, if you are told to go away, go away. That is purer for you. God knows well what you do. It wasn't this verse, huh? This was the next one, next one. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, you are asking permission, right? Why are you asking permission? Because you're expecting one of two things, either to, to be allowed in or be told to go away. So when you go away, don't go away with hard feelings then. Every time you ask permission to enter a place, you should put in mind that you may not be en allowed in. Maybe the, the guy is, dis is having a dispute with his wife and his wife is giving him hard time and she's uh, yeah, and he calling him bad names and he doesn't want you to see that. Because in the mosque, he is with the yani, big mustache, telling you that I am yani, the, the man of the house. But he doesn't want you to see what's happening in the house. Khalas, go away. Or maybe there are visitors who are visiting them, and uh, there's another family coming to see their daughter because um, they have the, yani, a groom. Khalas, he doesn't want you to come and visit at that time. So when someone goes out and asks you, please, we can't receive you right now. Please go away. Go away and accept this Command of Allah. Don't go away with bad feelings in your heart. Don't go away swearing at the man. Don't, don't actually uh, act as if you went and then you, 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 you stay in your car from, uh, in the dark watching the door of the house. Who will come out? You want to know who's inside? Yeah, accept. Accept. So if you are really asking permission, you need to be prepared for both possibilities. Either you are allowed in or sent back. And Allah says, Wallahu bima alim. Look at, always to reflect upon any verse, you need to do several things. One of them is to have imagination. You need to imagine the verse. And to look at how Allah ended the verse and try to understand why Allah chose this name or this ending for the verse. So here the verse says, we will, let's, let's uh, reflect upon this together. If you find no one in, do not enter unless you have been given permission to do so. If you are told, go away, then go away. That is purer for you. Listen to this end. God knows well what you do. Allah could have said, and God is the most merciful. But he didn't say, I'm the most merciful. He, he said, I know so well what you do. To reflect, imagine someone being told, please, we can't receive you now. Please go away. Allah knows what he will do. He may not go away. He may swear. He may hide. 
behind a wall or in his car trying to spy on people and see who's, who will come out after half an hour or something. Understand? So here Allah says, Allah knows well what you do. Always reflect upon every word in the verse. Allah did not choose the endings of these verses like that for, for no reason. Actually, there's a Sahabi that said, I lived all my life and wanted one thing to happen to me, but it never happened. I wanted one day to go and take permission to enter somebody's house and be told, go away. But it never happened. So he's so sad that no one ever told him to go away. He always wanted someone to tell him, go away, so that he can go away. Because, yeah, he, wants, he doesn't want to miss the reward of patience. Uh, because it's hard, by the way. It's not nice to be told, go away. Why is patience so rewardable? Because it's very difficult. It's very difficult to be patient. But how is patience rewardable? You know how? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, says, uh, إِنَّمَا that the patient ones will be rewarded according to the best of their deeds. What does it mean? That, for example, uh, what's your name, brother? Hassan. Brother Hassan dies. And he was a patient person in this life. So when he comes on the Day of Judgment, the first thing that he will ask, be asked about is what? Salah. Open his records. How many salahs should he, he should have done? 24,623. Was he a patient one? Yes. Which salah was the best salah? It was Salat al Isha on the 14th of Ramadan in the year so and so. Why? Because he made wudu at home and he went, by the way, it is rewardable to make wudu at home, by the way. Meet wudu at home and he came to the mosque and he was making adhkar on his way and he prayed with khushu' and he cried in his salah and Allah accepted this salah. That was the best salah. To be rewarded according to the best of his deeds means that all the rest, 24,621 salah, will all be upgraded as good as this one. Next, Saum. How many days? 943. Which one was the best? that day upgrade all to that next and so on why is it so rewardable because it's hard to be patient it's difficult to be patient so when you are ever in a tough situation thank allah this is your chance to be patient and feel the reward of patience one of the uh, uh, female companions was walking one day and then she stumbled and fell and her uh, nail was smashed and got out from her, from her toes. So it, you know, it's, it hurt so much, so she laughed. And the women with her told her, are you crazy? Isn't it painful? She said, it's extremely painful. Said, Why are you laughing? She said, I am, I am sensing the reward right now. Amazing people. Those are amazing people. Uh, okay. But there's a third uh, possibility. Either you are told, come in, or told, go back, or nothing happens. You don't hear anything. No permission is given, you just go back. Actually, silence is a permission when it's about marriage. A virgin, a woman who never got married before, may be too shy to say, yes, I want him. Yeah, she may be too shy. So if she's silent, this means she wants to, she, she's accepting. She, this is her consent to get married. But it's the opposite here. When you don't hear any permission from inside, it means maybe they are too shy to tell you go back. So it's, it's, it's not a consent. The verse number 29. You remember that we had a, a homework, huh? The verse says, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَدُخُلُوا بِيُوتًا غَيْرَ مُسْكُونَةٍ فِيهَا مَتَاعٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا تُبْدُونَ وَمَا تَكْتُمُونَ You will not be blamed for entering houses where no one lives 
and which could provide you with some useful service. God knows everything you do openly and everything you conceal, which means you can enter public places without permission. Houses where no one lives and you can be provided with services like restaurants, stores, Tesco's, all these places are the, you don't have to take permission before you enter these places. But the verse ends with, Wallahu ya'lamu ma tubduna wa ma taktumun. God knows everything you do openly and everything you conceal. Hmm. Who contemplated on this? Why did Allah end the verse with this? Who can tell me? There's a gift. Huh? You steal? No, it's about you don't. Allah is saying it's, uh, it's okay to enter public places without permission. And then Allah says, and Allah knows what you show to people and what you conceal in your hearts. Huh? Okay, why? Again, huh? What, what do you mean? To reflect upon a verse, you need to imagine it happening. Imagine with me someone standing outside Tesco's taking permission to enter. Allah says, I know what he conceals in his heart and what he shows to people. This is probably someone doing what? Standing outside Tesco's doesn't want to enter before the director of Tesco's comes and tell him you can enter. Exactly. Faked taqwa. Someone faking taqwa. Allah is, is actually uh, 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 telling us, be careful. Yani this verse actually, here. Allah is actually uh, telling us, be, be aware of people who are faking taqwa. There's a lot of humbleness that are faked around us. There's a lot of taqwa that are faked also around us. That's not good. You should be all really humble. You should be really uh, fearful of Allah, but not showing off. Okay. Oh. Give me 10 more minutes. Okay? Uh, by the way, public places and stores, the, the scholar said, it's open doors are already a permission for people to enter. Okay? And you know when you enter, when you come just any, uh, close to Tesco's, the doors open like that. What are you waiting for? Okay? This is an, that's a permission from their owner. And when they close the door, doesn't open. You don't have to knock the door. They're not allowing you. But I just wanted to look at all these verses that came and we discussed before. There's a concept in Sharia that says, Wherever there's a benefit for human beings, there lies the Sharia. The Sharia is about benefit. It benefits people, protects people. It doesn't put a burden on people. So you have to ask permission before you enter houses. If they are public places, then there is no need for permission. And if you are told to go back, then go back. All this is what? Benefit for people. The last verse that we will discuss today, verse number 30. <laughs> يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Tell believing men to lower from their glances or from their gaze. Not to lower their gaze. It's to lower from their gaze. Literally in Arabic it says يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Not يَغُضُّوا أَبْصَارَهُمْ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ to lower from their glances because you will need, of course, to you will see people, you will see women, but you need to lower the second gaze. And we will talk about this. And guard their private parts. There is purer for them, and Allah is aware of everything they do. 
Did you realize this? This verse has, this is purer for them. And the verse number 28 also that talked about um, number 28 that says if you don't find anyone in these houses don't enter and if you are told go back then go back same word this is purer for you why Allah mentioned purer here and purer there reflect the first one number 28 talks about when you are told to go back go back this is purer for you and this one Lower from your gaze and, and protect your private parts. This is purer for you. Huh? Yeah, but the issue is, purer here is associated always in, this, in those two verses actually with something that can happen secretly. So if you go, you're told to go back and you go and spy on them, this is something secret. Same thing. When you are told to lower from your gaze, some people appear like they are lowering the gaze, but they can see through the, they can see. Yeah. No, excuse me. There are people who lower their gaze when they are with their wives. Or because uh, dad sees me, or uncle sees me, or, but not Allah sees me. So Allah here mentioned this is purer for them. It means purifying your heart. Purifying your spirit, not purifying your body, purifying you internally. Don't you ever be good in the outside and bad in the, in the in, inside, from inside. If your outside looks better than your inside, then you're a hypocrite. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is people are people. Hypocrisy is when someone looks from outside better than inside. Your inside should be better than outside, actually. People should not know the good things that you're doing. Um, actually, this verse uh, here, like this is, you know, the, the, the verses before were giving us the etiquette of listening. You remember the verses about uh, burying the rumors before they start by not listening to rumors and what to listen to and what not. Now these are the etiquettes of looking. How to look and what to look at. The importance of these etiquettes is that it provides protection for the society and prevention of sins before they happen. Because actually, the sin, actually sexual, especially sins, do not just happen all of a sudden. It's graded, okay? The verse says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ قُلْ قُلْ means say. Any say in the Quran means say, O Muhammad. Any say in the Quran means say, Ya Muhammad. O Muhammad, say, tell them. The word say came 322 times in the Quran in four main contexts. All of them is for the Prophet to deliver a message. The first one can be delivering or confirming a fact like, Qul Allahu Ahad. Say, it is Allah, the unique, the uniquely one. That's a fact. Or a message, delivering a message to the kuffar. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ So it's a message to the uh, non-believers. Or challenging and debating. قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدٌ فَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْعَبَدِينَ Say, if a Rahman has a son, I'll be the first one to worship him. Challenge, debate. Or the fourth, which is to guide people on how they can worship Allah and live their life. Like this one, say or tell the believing men to lower from their gaze. Okay. Jarir ibn Abdullah said, I asked the Prophet about the sudden glance. I am someone who lowers my gaze, but suddenly I saw a woman semi-dressed. What can I do? It's called the sudden glance. So he commanded me to redirect my gaze. Israf nadarak. So khalas, you saw her? Israf nadarak. And he told Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, asking the same question about the sudden glance. He said, 
do not follow the glance with another glance because you are permitted the first one, but not the next. So the first glance, this is permitted for you. Then lower from your case. The first one is not for 30 seconds. Abu Sa'id said, the Prophet وسلم, said, never sit in the ways of people. We said, we can't meet to talk anywhere else. The Sahaba used to sit in the, in the streets to talk. There's nowhere else to go. He said, because it's not allowed to come and enter and speak in the mosque. If there are people praying, you can't interrupt people. He said, if you really have to sit there, then respect the etiquettes of the streets. We said, and what are they? He said, lowering the gaze. The Prophet did not say it from your gaze. He said, lowering the gaze, not hurting anyone, responding to salutations. When people salute you, you have to respond to the salutations, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. These are the four things of the etiquette of the street. And he also said, guarantee six for me, and I will guarantee for you paradise. If you guarantee six, the Prophet is guaranteeing paradise for you. One, if you talk, don't lie. If you are trusted, do not betray. If you promise, fulfill your promise. And lower your gaze and control your hands, which means don't hurt people. And control your sexual desires. If you do these six, the Prophet ﷺ is guaranteeing paradise for you. Again, when you talk, don't lie. When you're trusted, don't betray. When you promise, fulfill your promise. Lower your gaze. Control your hands and control your sexual desires. And he also said, every eye will weep on judgment day except an eye which was lowered from looking at what Allah has forbidden and a God-fearing eye which overflowed with tears. You know what, brothers? There is also a hadith da'if that says that the gaze is a poisoned arrow from the arrows of Iblis, shaitan. The one who avoids it, if you avoid the gaze, Allah will replace it with Sweetness of Iman that you can taste in your heart. Try it now when you go out. Try it tomorrow. That when you come across people who are not wearing properly, lower your gaze and immediately you will sense sweetness in your heart. Sweetness in the heart. Because Allah, where, why do people look? To enjoy. Allah will compensate you with enjoyment. Okay, um, we can stop here, but actually, before I, again, the last thing today, in this verse, Allah ended it with which name of his names? And Allah is aware of what you do. He didn't say Rahim, he said Alim. He knows well. In this verse number 28, 29, 30, he says, Wallahu khabirun bima yasna'un. Allah is well aware of everything they do. Why Allah it says, Allah knows well in these issues when you are dealing with in, in secret, doing things in secret, Allah says, he knows well. Allah is all aware, which means that there is nothing secret from him. Don't you ever think that anything is secret from him? 